Muscle damage happens after almost every strength training workout to some degree. And we normally think of muscle damage being caused when individual muscle fibres experience a high level of mechanical tension. And it's true that exposing a muscle fibre to high levels of tension does cause it to become damaged. However, muscle damage is also caused when individual muscle fibres are exposed to certain chemical changes. So when we're thinking about muscle damage and the effects of a workout on producing muscle damage, we have to be thinking about both the mechanical factors and also the chemical factors. In terms of the mechanical factors, there are two major things that we need to be thinking about. One is that the mechanical tension on the whole muscle fibre, while it's being lengthened, does determine to a large degree how much damage is caused to that muscle fibre. However, the location of the damage will be determined in part by the length of individual sarcomeres. So in any given muscle fibre, which is made up of a chain of sarcomeres, some of those sarcomeres will be at longer lengths than others. And it's the sarcomeres that are at longer lengths experience greater levels of tension and therefore greater levels of damage after the workout. In terms of the chemical factors, we know that exposing a muscle fibre to calcium ions for an extended period of time causes it to become damaged. The calcium ions trigger the release of proteases called calpanes, which degrade the inside of the muscle fibre and cause damage to its structures. Similarly, we know that after a given workout, we often observe a, an inflammatory response, and this inflammatory response involves the infiltration of neutrophils into muscle fibres, and this again causes breakdown of structures inside the muscle fibre, which we then observe as muscle damage. Now, we don't know what proportion of the muscle damage that's caused after a strength training workout is caused by the mechanical factors and what proportion is caused by the chemical factors. And in fact, the proportions might differ according to the type of workout that we do. But we do know that the chemical factors are important. Studies that have measured the effects of chemical factors like calpanes that are released in response to calcium ions have found that when we block the release of either calcium ions or calpanes, then we massively reduce the amount of muscle damage that the muscle fibres experience. And this demonstrates that the chemical factors are quite important for the process of muscle damage during strength training. This is important because it can explain some results in the research literature that otherwise may look quite strange. For example, when we perform a workout with light or moderate loads, we generally find that strength recovery is faster when training with moderate loads than when training with light loads. And since strength recovery is our standard measurement of how much muscle damage has been caused by the workout, this indicates that training with light loads actually causes more damage to a muscle than training with moderate loads, which we might not expect if we were thinking about muscle damage being purely caused by mechanical factors. But when we think about muscle damage being caused by sustained exposure to calcium ions, then it makes much more sense that we could experience a greater amount of muscle damage after training with light loads than after training with moderate loads. Now, if you want to understand exactly what's going on inside a muscle after it's been damaged by a strength training workout, then we need to think about the way in which the muscle fibers are grouped. Now, muscle fibres are grouped into motor units, and the motor units are recruited in size order from low threshold motor units uh, with only small numbers of muscle fibres that are themselves fairly small in diameter uh, through to high threshold motor units, which uh, control large numbers of muscle fibres, which themselves are quite large in diameter. And it's the muscle fibres, the large muscle fibres of the high threshold motor units that are damaged after strength training. And there are a couple of theories as to why this might be. Uh, one of them is that those muscle fibres are much less oxidative and it's this factor that causes them to become more, more easily damaged. Um, another factor could be that they contain stiffer titan molecules and therefore uh, those muscle fibres experience greater mechanical tension when they're exposed to exactly the same change in length. So uh, regardless of the actual mechanism, 
it's the um, muscle fibers of high threshold motors that are damaged after a strength training workout and it's those we need to think about if we want to understand the effects of strength training on muscle damage and the resulting effects on things like training frequency. Now several studies have shown that if we perform a muscle damaging workout in the recovery period from a previous muscle damaging workout, and that could be one or two days afterwards, then there is no further muscle damage caused by that second muscle damaging workout. Um, the recovery of strength from the uh, first workout continues at exactly the same rate regardless of whether we performed that uh, additional workout or not. So from a muscle damage perspective it's as if the second workout hadn't happened at all. Now this has been attributed to the presence of central nervous system fatigue at the point where we perform the second workout. Now when central nervous system fatigue is present then that means that the high threshold motor unit uh, cannot be activated uh, during the workout. No matter how hard we try, we can't recruit those motor units and we can't uh, activate those muscle fibers. And as a result, it's very hard to damage them. So um, during that second workout, we don't recruit those motor units, we don't activate those muscle fibers, and we don't cause any further damage to the muscle fibers that were damaged in the original workout. Although it makes a lot of sense that muscle damage uh, triggers central nervous system fatigue in order to protect the muscle in the, the days after it's been damaged, we don't actually know exactly how it happens. The original theory was that pain caused by the muscle damage from the original workout would inhibit the activation of the muscle in a subsequent workout. Um, the only problem with this theory was that the uh, central nervous system fatigue that happens after workout starts out very high immediately after the workout and decays gradually over the couple of days afterwards. Uh, in contrast, the uh, delayed onset muscle soreness response starts out very low in the day immediately following the workout and gradually rises to a peak in the 24 to 48 hours thereafter. So there's a, a disconnect between the profile of central nervous system fatigue after a muscle damaging workout and the amount of muscle soreness. So that's probably not the cause of the central nervous system fatigue. Uh, a replacement theory is that it's the inflammatory response that happens after muscle damaging workouts that is responsible for the uh, central nervous system fatigue. And this makes a lot more sense because uh, the inflammatory response peaks very quickly after a workout and decays over the sort of 24 to 48 hours thereafter. During any strength training program, it's the muscle fibers of the high threshold motor units that adapt as a result of performing each workout. Therefore, it's very important that we avoid training while we are still experiencing central nervous system fatigue from a previous muscle damaging workout because that central nervous system fatigue will prevent us from recruiting those high threshold motor units, prevent us from activating those muscle fibers and will prevent us from achieving any adaptions from the workout whatsoever. So we could put an enormous amount of effort into a workout and achieve no adaptions which would be a total waste of our time and resources. In practice, this means that the optimal training frequency for a muscle group in a training program is determined entirely by the amount of muscle damage that each workout in the program causes to that muscle group. Because the amount of muscle damage that a workout causes to a muscle group is what determines the amount of central nervous system fatigue that that muscle group then experiences for the couple of days after the workout. So when a workout causes a muscle group a lot of muscle damage, then central nervous system fatigue will be quite sustained for several days thereafter and we'll have to train that muscle group less frequently in that training program. In contrast, if a workout only causes a muscle group a small amount of muscle damage, then we'll be able to train that muscle group with that particular workout much more frequently. There are three major factors that affect how much muscle damage a muscle experiences after a workout. Firstly, 
There's the content of the workout itself, in terms of the sets, reps and volume and those kind of things. Secondly, there's the nature of the muscle group itself, so some muscle groups are more easily damaged than others. And thirdly, there's the individual characteristics of the person doing the training. So some people naturally experience more muscle damage than others. So each of these three factors will affect how much muscle damage is caused after a workout um, and also therefore affect the optimal training frequency for that muscle group in that uh, context of workouts and with that particular person. So any attempt to determine the optimal training frequency for all workouts and all people and all muscle groups is fundamentally flawed and will never achieve any kind of sensible answer. What we need to do is look at the optimal training frequency for each person in the context of each workout program and in the context of each muscle group.